I was playing, Lane. I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I have a wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bradford? Yes, sir. Um, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at the bachelor's establishment the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. <laughs> Good heavens, is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I've only been married once. That was a consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. <laughs> I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, then. No, <laughs> sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Mm -hmm. Very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower altar since sets a good example, what on earth is the use of them? He seems a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? I think you up to town. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Meeting as usual, I see, Algie. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since that first day? In the country. What on earth do you do that? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. <laughs> it is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbours. Neighbours. You've got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. <laughs> I would mention you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Uh, Shropshire? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, it's all very well. But I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. <laughs> I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you'd come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. No, I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why one may be accepted. <sighs> one usually is, I believe. Then the excitement's all over. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algie. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Well, there's no new speculation on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Uh, please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially from Tessa. <laughs> well, you've been eating them all the time. But that is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. <laughs> Have some bread and butter. <laughs> the bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. And Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. And very good bread and butter it is too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat it as if you were going to eat it all. You behave as if you're married to her already. You're not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well. In the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. 
Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of batches one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. <laughs> Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? Uh, what on earth do you mean? What on earth do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I, I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. <clears throat> Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you'd let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. <laughs> well, I wish you would offer one. They have to be more than usually hot up. <laughs> there is no good offering a large reward. Uh, now that the thing is found. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. <laughs> However, it makes no matter. But now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing is a choice after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you've no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. But it is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware <laughs> of the fact. And I don't propose to discuss modern culture. And this is the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes. <laughs> but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, charming old lady she is too. It lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algie. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her father's love. My dear Algie, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, and some aunts are not tall. <laughs> that is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That is absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? <laughs> From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear uncle Jack. There is no <coughs> objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. <laughs> Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You've always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> you are the most earnest looking person I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> It's perfectly absurd you're saying your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany. I'll keep this as a proof that your name is Ernest, and whether you attempt to deny it to me, or to Wendland, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and Jack in the country. <laughs> and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. <laughs> <laughs> 